Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We are excited to have over 260 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee a Webinar Wednesday lunch bag for answering this trivia question. What is the official flower of the Kentucky Derby? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to invite everyone to join us for the full MD Expo conference, which will bring HTM professionals from across the nation to Seattle, October 5th to 7th, for three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in technology, products, and services. More details can be found at mdexposhow.com forward slash Seattle. Okay, and let's see who the winner of our webinar Wednesday baggage and it is Spencer McLean. Congratulations Spencer and the correct answer is a red rose. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor Conquest Imaging. Conquest Imaging is the largest supplier of ultrasound parts, probes, transducers, probe transducer repair, training, service and free 24-7 technical support. For more information please visit conquestimaging.com. Our presenter today is Bob Rochart, Senior Director of Technical Operations at Conquest Imaging. Bob, you may begin whenever you are ready. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Uh, well, I want to welcome everyone uh, to this webinar Wednesday. And today, um, hopefully you're all prepared to speak about ultrasound probes. And um, I hope they're as near and dear to your heart as they are mine. Uh, just give you a little background on myself. Um, I've got a little over 30 years in the diagnostic ultrasound business. Uh, I've done a little bit of everything from uh, manufacturing, quality control, service, sales, marketing, uh, and engineering. So I've kind of been fortunate, in my opinion, to be in a little bit of every aspect, aspect of, um, of this market. And um, I'm would say I'm quite passionate about ultrasound. I think it's one of the technologies that um, I am sure those of you in it continue to see its ever expanding role in the clinical environment. It's used in more and more um, clinical applications that even, even 10 or 20 years ago, um, ultrasound was never even thought of. So uh, today we want to want to talk a little bit about uh, those new technologies. Um, how, how we can test those and things like that. And um, as most of you know, uh, if you are working in ultrasound uh, from a service perspective uh, or even a clinical user, um, it's, it's a well-known fact, obviously, that the probes are the highest failure uh, part or item, if you will, on an ultrasound system. Um, and I think a lot of us know why that is. Uh, some of it is just normal wear and tear and failure, but Probes, just due to their very nature, they're, they're subject to damage, accidental damage, um, misuse, improper cleaning. We could go on and on. But uh, what it means is that uh, we're going to continue to see probes fail now and in the future. And uh, what I hope to do today for you all is give you an idea of what's available out there on the testing side. Um, I'm going to show you some of the uh, products and companies out there that are providing test equipment that, that is available to you in the HTM market um, and just talk about why it's important, I think, to, to test probes um, and, and, and give a thorough examination of problems before uh, you either send it out for repair or have it replaced. So with that, I'm just going to move in here and just give you a little bit of, of an agenda. So uh, I think it's important we'll start out where we're at today, technology-wise with probes more so on the array side and, and how that works. Uh, we're obviously going to talk about some of the new array technologies and things that are out there. We're going to talk a lot about probe electronics. Um, uh, that is an ever-expanding field as far as the development of new probes. They're becoming uh, more and more electronic in nature. Um, we're going to go through the testing devices and some of these methods that are being used to test these new technologies and, and again, kind of what's available out there to you uh, to help you better manage your probe inventory in your, in your um, uh, environments. 
Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about electrical leakage testing and its importance. Uh, again, what's available out there that may be different. Uh, tissue phantoms, air scans, et cetera, some of the other um, current established methodologies that are still used out there, obviously, and um, what the, some of the strengths and weaknesses of those uh, testing methods are. A um, little bit specific, we're going to go into more standard and general imaging probes and, and some of the testing and things, things that you need to look for uh, for those probe types. Uh, we're going to do the same with some of the 3D, 4D models out there, uh, transesophageal um, testing as well. Um, then we're going to get wrapped up a little bit with some of the economics of testing, uh, um, where just a couple of slides where we're going to talk about uh, the economic impact or the financial impact uh, of doing testing uh, of the probes and what it means really to, to your, your health system or hospital or practice and some of those real costs that are there. And then really what do these technologies mean to you now and as, as these new technologies come in the future, how's that going to impact uh, what you need to do to service um, your, your customers within your facility? And then we'll wrap it up with just a, a general uh, question and answer format. So taking a look at just where we're at today, um, on the left is the world's first ultrasound system, if you will. Um, you can see the patient sitting in a, essentially a bathtub, a water bath. Uh, this was in 1954. Um, bulky tube-based electronics, um, uh, you know, things that was, were high-tech in, in the 50s. Uh, but now you look at where we're at today, uh, roughly 64 years later. So now we've got smartphone ultrasounds. We've got wireless probes on some systems. Uh, we've got small handheld pro uh, systems and probes. Um, you know, the laptops, the portable market, um, that's one of the highest, gro uh, highest uh, growth rate uh, parts of the ultrasound market today, and um, it's running a little over 8% uh, annual growth rate, which is amazing. Um, and, and again, you know, ultrasound is being used in so many different clinical applications now. Uh, and a, a large part of it is because the, the manufacturers, as they do so well, are, are continually developing new products and new technologies that really allow ultrasound to be used in these different clinical applications. Um, I've seen more and more ultrasound in, in being used by podiatrists even, uh, you know, looking at feet. And um, uh, it's been in oncology now for a while on, on the cancer side, but looking at tumors and, and uh, so on. But uh, veterinarian use is huge with, with ultrasound. And where some of these small handheld devices are going is, is literally uh, trying to market it into the family practice, general practitioner, as well as the hospital, and replace the stethoscope. I've heard that many, many times at many trade shows and uh, other uh, sessions I've sat in where uh, some of these devices, they're hoping one day will replace this, this stethoscope rather than listen, you know, to your heart rate. Um, they can see your heart and they can do a Doppler and, and get the readings they need and actually do a quick visual. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, continued use of ultrasound. So um, it's, it's a, a modality, I believe, that's going to continue to grow and expand in use. So how do the probes fit into this new technology? Um, well, first of all, the, you know, the probe is, um, I, I consider it the data transmission device, for lack of a better word. So most ultrasound machines, well, really all ultrasound machines, I, uh, I kind of dumb the, or call them a, the dumb device. Um, and I don't mean that negatively. It's just that the, any ultrasound machine is only going to take back the information that the probe transmits to it. Or, and it receives that data in, and it's going to process it. So if it gets junk back, it's going to process junk out. Um, and it's, that's why I'm, I'm, again, so passionate about, um, uh, about the probe 
as, as I am because if the probe is functioning 100%, then you still have system problems, as we all know, but the chances are of the probe um, providing good data back is better and the machine can be um, fixed if need be. But if we start at the very front end with bad data, uh, we have no chance. So you know, today, most ultrasound transducers use what's called a PZT ceramic um, a crystal array. It's um, a ceramic compound. Um, it's been around for several years now. Um, it is a good performing piezoelectric material. Uh, one of the reasons a lot of the manufacturers uh, continue to use it, uh, it's relatively easy to produce. It's uh, raw materials are available. Um, it's um, I've got a known known performance level, I call it, uh, as I put on the slide. Um, you know, they know that out of that that type of array, they can expect a certain performance level, and they still manufacture probes um, using using these array types, and they're used in every type of of probe model, a curve. Uh, linear, convex, TE, et cetera. And again, there's there's new uh, ultrasound system platforms that come out on the market and they're using PCT type array um, probes and they work just fine. Um, they, they are limited somewhat. These are your typical individual element arrays and I'll show you kind of how they're constructed here in the next couple slides. But um, one of the disadvantages is you can only go up to 288 elements in a uh, PZT array. It's just without making the array so large that it would be absolutely impossible to utilize in a, in a physical environment, um, you can really only go up to, to the uh, 288 elements. So that limits you uh, from a capability standpoint as far as image quality and, and things like that. So that's why as we get into it uh, in a bit, I'll show you where some of these new array types uh, have changed the landscape of ultrasound. So again, PZT array, uh, it's a piezoelectric material. Um, this, again, kind of shows you the typical element breakdown. Um, they cut the individual elements. Uh, it's put on a spine that holds the elements together. Then they fill it usually with a, a polymer uh, or epoxy type material because uh, they do need to keep each individual element uh, uh, both electrically isolated uh, as well as keeping it um, uh, in, a, in a form, to keep it formed from a uh, structural standpoint. Um, every one of these elements is going to get a, an individual coax wire to it. Um, and I have a slide on the next slide. I'll show you that a little better. Uh, but again, the, these, from a manufacturing standpoint, um, they, they've really got the technology down on these type of arrays. So they, they, they know how to make them. Uh, they get a high yield out of these from a manufacturing perspective. So they don't have a lot uh, of these that are destroyed or, or damaged in the manufacturing process. So again, their production yield is, is pretty high. And, um, and again, they, they put out some very good uh, probes using these, these type of arrays. Uh, this is another one, just kind of looking at how it's, um, how it's assembled, if you will, or what we, some of us call the array stack, the array assembly. So you've got your, if you start at the part that touches the patient, as we all know, is the acoustic lens. Uh, that material can be made out of uh, several different substances. A lot of them are silicone based. Um, there's a matching layer right behind that on every probe. A matching layer is an impedance matching layer. Uh, then you have your elements your, your, or your actual crystal array itself. Um, there's a backing layer that goes on the back of every array. Uh, that's to prevent um, scatter from the um, return echoes. Um, and uh, all these things contribute problems as well. We'll talk about that a bit too. Uh, on the probe housing itself, there's an RF shield uh, and then your plastic cases. And then again, you see on, on a PZT type of array, you're going to have an individual micro coax wire connected to every single uh, element. 
Um, and again, most probes, transesophageal probes, for instance, run at 64 elements typically, um, up to uh, 256 elements in some of your uh, high frequency small parts probes using, using these type of arrays. Um, a lot of arrays, curves, and so on will run 128 to 192 channels. So if you think about that from a perspective and, and uh, digress a bit into the repair side or we're, and or the uh, problem identification part of testing of probes, if you've got a small parts probe with 256 elements, you've got 256 micro coax in there, and any one of them or combination thereof could be a problem. So again, you can kind of see where testing uh, is important. But again, all these things uh, in this assembly can delaminate, uh, break down, et cetera, and cause problems. And again, this is just another shot, um, kind of what the probe assembly looks like um, within, the, within the housing. Um, and again, just being important to know what we're looking at, uh, what could be causing the problems. Um, there's just a lot of things that can go bad uh, with probes nowadays that, that are really not the crystal. Um, a lot of you, again, working in this area know about um, what, what they call dead elements uh, or dropout is another common phrase. Um, but there's a lot of things that will look like that if you don't have proper testing. And um, more of the problems are just the, the lenses delaminate uh, or get puncture holes in them. Uh, the backing material can decouple. That'll cause a lot of noise and things in the probe. Um, a lot of cabling issues that can look like dead elements. And then if you throw in the ultrasound system itself, obviously you've got issues where you can have a channel out in the beamformer. Um, we've seen Customers send in probes that they said were bad, only to find out the system's uh, high voltage power supply was bad, so the probe wasn't wasn't running, wouldn't run any of the probes. But yet um, they felt the probe was bad. So um, there's there's a lot of things you got to look for when you're when you're looking at, at at problems with your ultrasound probe. So let's let's delve into the the new technology world a little bit. So one of, the, one of the biggest changes, and it occurred a few years ago, in uh, ultrasound probe technology was uh, single crystal arrays. Uh, that uses a different type of material. Uh, there's a, it's called a PMNPT and a PZNPT. And single crystals um, really changed the landscape, in my humble opinion, of image quality and image performance. Um, they literally are a single piece of crystal material. So um, the, the name, the, the buzzword, if you will, the, fits the name of actually what it does. Um, they are, they're not individual elements. Um, they're, they're more electronic in control. Um, such an image performance increase uh, to me, it's it's amazing what some of these do. If you take, for instance, the uh, uh, Philips C5-1 abdominal probe or uh, any of their matrix arrays like the uh, X5-1 uh, cardiac echo probe and, and so on, um, GE's got some as well, Siemens. They, they really improve image quality. Um, you know, it's to the point now where uh, those of us that have been doing this for a while, if you go back, um, you would put a probe on a patient, and then you, you immediately have to start adjusting the uh, TGCs and gain controls and so on and so forth to try to get your image. In many cases now, especially through software, um, the probe is connected. You, as you know, you pick your clinical application mode that you're in, and it presets everything. So you, in many cases, you can slap the probe right on, on the patient and uh, get an amazing image. And I think the single crystal arrays uh, have really contributed to, to that ability. 
Uh, one of the things that is really, um, again, I think it also leads into the fact of probes being able to be, or ultrasound, excuse me, being able to be used in different clinical applications is now if you use a, um, a single crystal probe, well, the essential element count, uh, again, I'll tell you it's one element, but the way it, it's used, um, you can get up to essentially at 9,000 active elements uh, from a, from a uh, performance standpoint. Uh, and that's amazing. With the amount of data you're going to get back um, from, the, from the patient, uh, it just naturally equates to better image quality. Um, single crystal arrays have allowed for the matrix array development that are used in some of the, uh, for instance, Philips X probes, like the, like I said, the X5-1, uh, the X7-2, 3D, 4DT probe, and others. Um, again, it's a, it's a unique, um, it's a unique array. Um, and the little picture there kind of shows you the um, layout of a matrix array. Uh, and how it, it's gridded out. That's still one single crystal, but um, they grid it out. And the way they, they work single crystals is they, they fire the array in, in electronic zones, if you will. Uh, and that's how they develop the, the image, 2D image. Some of the downfalls, though, to uh, single crystals, um, it is a high cost to manufacture these. Uh, there's not a lot of array companies in the world that actually can, can manufacture these successfully. Um, it's a, a whole new way of manufacturing ultrasound probes, uh, probe arrays, I should say. Um, the yield is lower. Um, I know of one company uh, overseas who does, does do a good job of manufacturing single crystal arrays. Um, but they have maybe a 50, 60% yield rate uh, in their manufacturing process without out destroying the, um, the elements. And um, obviously what that does is pushes the cost up. Uh, that's why those of us on, on this end in the hospital environment, supplier environment, we see um, the, the expense of these type of probes go up uh, because they are expensive for the manufacturers as well. Um, like I said, there's, there's not a lot of array companies out there that can produce these. Um, some that I know of have completely shied away from it. Uh, they continue to produce the uh, ceramic PZTs, and they're just fine with that. They have plenty of business, and, and uh, the, the world is good. So, um, again, it's, it's, that's another reason it's so expensive, though. Um, they do fail a little bit more. They're a little more um, prone to temperature changes. Uh, you know, you want to keep these in a good environment, not too cold, not too hot, um, because they also uh, put out a little more acoustic power. Uh, they're going to get a little warmer, so you have to be careful with that. Um, and they just need a little bit better care, in my opinion. Um, one of the downsides, we'll talk a little bit more about this in this session, is uh, there's a lot of these single crystal and matrix probes, unfortunately, today, um, cannot be tested properly uh, on an individual basis. Um, some of the companies that we're going to talk about, they're working on it, and they're, they're uh, looking at, at ways to bring technologies out there um, for you to test it, um, but they are complex probes and um, it, it takes some time to develop the proper testing for these. But it definitely, single crystal is a matrix array development um, is definitely the future of ultrasound in my opinion. Again, just a little bit uh, more on uh, single crystal, I'll show you what, kind of how they're made. Um, you can see the picture on the left, uh, that's a human hair, and then there's your, um, grid, if you will, uh, on a single crystal array. So they're very, very tiny, obviously. Um, one of the things I hear a lot is people will say, uh, well, I've got a dead element on my, my single crystal probe. <laughs> um, that's kind of a misnomer. Um, you really can't have a dead element 
you could have a dead zone, you could have uh, an issue where you've got some electronic problems, cable, cabling is, again, uh, we've got some wiring problems, etc. But you really can't have a dead element in a single crystal array because that would mean the whole element's dead. Um, I mentioned that they do have a higher acoustic power output. Um, a lot of electronics, they're, they're highly multiplexed. We'll talk about multiplexing as well. Um, and again, they're just higher cost probes. Um, and any of you that have had to deal with any of the uh, Phillips matrix probes or some of the GE ones, um, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, they're, just, they're just expensive probes. Um, but again, the, the image quality is amazing on them. And um, uh, I think it's well worth the uh, effort to, to continue to look at how we can better manage these technologies and, and uh, better work to repair these probes. So obviously with some of the newer technologies that are out there, and I'm just really going to touch on that today, um, you know, I mentioned that we've got now we've got wireless probes and systems, we've got the smartphones with wireless probes, uh, the matrix arrays, there's a technology that really hasn't hit the um, clinical market yet, but has been developed and still being developed over the last several years is um, CMUT technology, which is an electronic, it's an electronic array. It removes the uh, crystal, piezoelectric crystal element and really uses um, uh, electronics to create an image. And uh, that's a picture of a CMUT array, if you will, um, right there. That, that's All these things are going to cause more problems in the future as we continue to have to service these devices. And, and look at, at ways to, to repair them and replace them, et cetera. Um, you know, with the wireless probes, I, you know, we're going to get into transmitter issues and things that are really outside of just the actual arrays that are in these probes and, and what problems can occur from them. Uh, so I also uh, foresee it happening. I haven't heard of it yet, but um, I can see a sonographer putting the probe in their pocket and uh, going home for the night. And the device is still in the hospital, but the probe's miles away. So I think it's going to happen uh, just by accident. But um, again, these are going to be devices that uh, I think it's incumbent upon uh, all of us in the market to determine how can we test these properly um, and get them repaired properly, et cetera. But, um, they're out there and, and they're coming and we all need to prepare uh, for what those challenges will be. So again, talking uh, about probes today and, and, and this, the new technologies that are out there, obviously, as I said, they're, I think they're more dependent on electronics than ever before. I think we see more electronic problems than uh, we ever have in the, in the past. Um, you know, there's, there's circuit boards now, not just in the connectors, as there always has been of probes, but more and more, uh, some of the active electronics are, are in the probe head itself. Um, and that sets up a whole new problem uh, metrics and also um, further uh, enhances the, the fact that we need to be able to properly test probes. Um, you know, what can be dead elements uh, as I kind of mentioned before, especially in single crystal arrays, uh, it's now caused by dead components. Um, we, we see it a lot. And um, you just have to be able to look out for those. Um, again, some of the things that you'll see, we get this a lot, um, the, the system error codes that come up with a, like an overcurrent draw error or, uh, you know, will not recognize the probe. Um, uh, other things. And um, a lot of those things are caused by the probe or and or electronics in the probe. Um, and again, it's just a whole another set of, of problems that have to be identified. And the way you identify this is again, what we're talking about here in a minute is how do we properly test these. 
So, again, one of the big things uh, that are that's being done in a lot of probes these days is multiplexing. Um, it's it's definitely used to again it basically is used to bring back more uh, data from the patient's uh, anatomy or you know whatever we're scanning within their body, um, but um, it's also causing issues from a testing standpoint, uh, as well as problems, again, that uh, occur in the probe. And like I said, uh, many, many times, especially on what probes we know are multiplexed, um, we tend to look more for electronic problems first than actually something in the array or, or something like that. And um, we have to keep in mind of how, how these probes work and then again, being able to, to test them with these multiplexing issues. Now, if, you, if you're not really familiar with multiplexing, and I just pulled the actual terminology out of, off of Wikipedia, but um, you know, sometimes it's called muxing, um, and really, it's it's a method where you can have multiple signals, and as you can see, they're either analog or digital, uh, and you put them over the same. Uh, Wikipedia says shared medium, and in the case of ultrasound, it's the same conducting wire, the co micro coax wire. And it's just timed out so you have a send receive, send receive, send receive, all along each individual coax wire. Uh, but it's a good, a good example uh, that Wikipedia uses is, is telephone calls. Um, so you can have several calls running along the same wire. And it's the same thing, uh, they're just timed out. Uh, electronically so that they don't interfere with each other. And the same is really used in ultrasound. Um, you can see the switch there, that's a muxing switch and um, demuxing switch on the other side. Um, and that's really what it's doing. There's one wire there, but it's picking up signals from different points. And in, the, in ultrasound, it's um, uh, again, it's, it's significantly increased the amount of data that comes back from a patient exam to the probe. And then again, the system can turn around and process that better, and um, we get better image quality and, and a better diagnosis for the patient. Again, this is just a, a quick slide to show you a, a typical multiplex circuit, uh, transmit receive circuit. Um, this is in a matrix array. Um, we see these switches go bad. And, uh, it's it can be a lot of problems, but um, uh, and most of the time when we get those um, overcurrent error problems and things, um, we start looking in here first, and typically that's where we'll find a problem. So. I hear this a lot, um, is, is testing really important? And I mean in, in terms of ultrasound probes. Well, um, just just two things that I, I bring up here and I'll, I'll talk a bit on this slide. You know, to me, if you can't test a device, how, how do we really expect to repair it if we cannot test it properly? Um, and I think the, the old, well, I think it's fixed. I, you know, I tried to fix it, I think it's fixed. I don't think that's an option any longer. Um, I don't think it's been an option for a long time, but um, I don't. I don't believe that in today's environment that we can we can live by that. Um, I am a big believer, uh, right or wrong, um, that I think ultrasound probes need to be separated from the system to be tested. Um, and again, I'm going to talk about that with some of these devices, but. Um, the combination of the system and the probe can be a problem. Now, not always. I won't say that always, but and I know some of the, the newer platforms on the market uh, by some of the larger manufacturers have probe testing um, software and, and um, choices in those to do that, it built within a system. Um, but um, I think we've got to be able to look at the probe as a separate entity whenever possible. Uh, again, there are ways to, to do it, but um, at the very least, we have to look at the probe as the probe and not have interference from a, uh, a bad system. 
So some of the what I call established testing devices that are out there, uh, you know, there's there's been electrical leakage for probes, uh, meters, and devices out there for that for a while. There's always the live testing. Uh, the uh, first call is a well-established, uh, very usable device, uh, and, and tissue phantoms as well. All, all these devices, um, even when they came out, changed the face of ultrasound probe testing, in my opinion. Uh, and then they continue to be very, very useful tools. Um, there are limits, unfortunately, um, but again, they have, have been useful and still are being used today. Uh, we use them as well in our lab. But what's some of the new stuff that are out there? And I'll go through these more specifically. But, you know, there are new devices out there uh, by some companies that are more geared towards these single crystal uh, array probes and matrix probes and just some of the new challenges that the new technologies and ultrasound uh, probes um, have caused. And, you know, again, these companies believe in testing these devices properly, and they've come up with ways to do that. So one of the, one of the devices out there now uh, is by uh, Aceter Acoustic Labs called the Arion. Um, the Arion, in my opinion, is a very unique device. Um, it looks at the acoustic power level, um, and it does a lot more, but um, it... Um, one of its main things is to look at how much power is going to the actual probe aperture, the probe head. And you can see on the left a, a working probe, and you see one on the right that's got a problem. Um, it's unique in the fact that um, it, it's uh, not dependent on adapters and things like that. Um, it's current product, it's available on the market, um, and does some really, really neat things. They continue development. Uh, on, on this product. And again, the one thing uh, about the Arion, you can test any probe on it because it, it's not looking, it doesn't use adapters. Um, it's not looking at a, uh, like a first call, it's not looking at just a sweep of, of the elements and things like that. And uh, it lets you kind of move the, the device from, from system to system and utilize the system um, to uh, provide the output power. Um, it's quick, um, you, can, you, you know, as you can see, you can slap a probe on it and immediately see that you've got an issue somewhere. Um, it's small, it's compact, um, doesn't require a lot of setup or, or alignment and things like that. If any of you use the first call, well, it's a great device. It requires aligning the probe up in a water tank and things like that. So. Uh, the Arion is designed to, to be easy to use, um, and like I said, it, it has a lot of unique features uh, in its ability to look at the, uh, the acoustic power. Uh, some other devices out there, um, there's a company, uh, BBS Medical, that uh, has a device called the Probe Hunter. Um, it's similar in look to uh, the first call. Um, it does a few things different. It uh, has a dynamic testing um, methodology. So it, it's looking at the probe, not in a static sweep and, and displaying uh, uh, what the array looks like, but it, it's dynamic in the fact that it's doing it in real time. Um, neat little feature on it is that um, it's got a cable testing uh, section in it. So you can wiggle a probe cable while you're scanning the, um, the probe and you can see if wires are broken or shorted and it'll display different colors, red, yellow, etc., green if it's good. Um, so you can see that you've got a broken cable or broken wires in a cable. Um, some other things it can do, it, um, uh, you can quickly add probes to the database. It's easy to write your own, uh, what we call probe files. Uh, it does use adapters, like the first call, um, and it does separate the, the probe from the system. Um, but um, uh, again, it's, it's got some unique features out there, and, and again, it's another device that is out there available, uh, and they've got some handheld devices as well. 
Um, and again, this takes more of a kind of a more traditional first call approach, if you will, with some, some different features. Uh, there's a company called ProBlogic uh, that also offers a uh, couple of unique devices. Theirs are more specific to transesophageal and 3D, 4D probes. Um, they do some really in-depth testing with their devices. Um, uh, on the 3D, 4D side, it can look at is the probe centering properly in its sweep uh, with 3D, 4D probes, you know, they're electromechanical. Um, it looks at the rotation and other things on TE probes that are that are using rotation of the array. It's got an uh, electromechanical uh, interface. Um, they're geared towards at least on these two type of probe uh, uh, probe functions. They look at ways that you can catch problems early uh, and avoid some downtime. Really, um, their whole thing is to use these on PMs and things like that. Um, and, and try to catch problems before they actually fail. So you'll start to see, you know, is the sweep on a 3D, 4D probe starting to, to fail? And you can catch it and get it fixed while it's still a, a minor issue. Uh, the interfaces are really easy to use on these. They're, they're um, designed to be quick uh, and used in a, in a, a hospital environment for um, HCM professionals. So uh, again, very, very unique devices. <clears throat> leakage testing, uh, as I said earlier, you know, we've all used electrical leakage meters for years, uh, but I do know I'm a big fan of the BC Group uh, probe only meter. Um, it, um, in my opinion, I like to take the probe off, and I think it makes sense to electrical leakage test your probes separately. Uh, too many problems. I've seen way too many problems when people try to do them on the systems and they say, oh, no, the probe's causing the problem. Well, yeah, but no, you've got a peripheral device or you've got a printer or something hooked up to it, and that's the real problem while your leakage high. Uh, it, there's just too many problems, a myriad of things that can occur. Um, it's a simple test. It still uses a saline water bath. Um, BC Group, you can buy adapters. Um, Again, Acetera has a very unique device that I, I like, it's kind of a universal adapter. It's compatible with the BC Group tester as well as their own. Um, and you can put multiple probe connector types on there, including some of the Sonosite, um, kind of the flat, thinless Sonosite connectors. Um, and I, I think, um, again, if you can test your probes uh, at a PM, test them separately, these, these meters are well worth the, uh, the investment. And they're really important, obviously, on the transesophageal side. Tissue phantoms, um, again, there's even some new tissue phantoms out there. Some have been around a little bit, but not, <clears throat> not too long. Um, there's kind of a, a universal, I call it. It um, lets you test all probe types, <coughs> excuse me. Um, transesophageal, um, endoprobes, endocavity probes. Um, it, these, are, these are really nice in the fact that you don't have to have maybe three or four different type of phantoms. I know some people like to buy small tissue phantoms that look only at high frequency probes. Uh, these models and, and um, um, uh, Cirrus ATS labs and Nesotera have them available. Um, I really like these because, again, you need one tissue phantom. And with tissue phantoms, you know, you're really testing, see what your resolution looks like, uh, your focus, the depth of penetration, et cetera. So they still play, in my opinion, a valuable role in evaluating your probes. Um, because with, with any of the test devices that I, I, I just showed you, you, you can't test what the resolution is going to be. What's the Axial lateral resolution, the image going to look like. You can't check Doppler, things like that. Um, but with a tissue phantom, you can at least check the 2D imaging performance. Air scan testing. Um, I will go on record as I was saying I'm not a huge fan of air scan testing. Um, that air is the fastest transmitter of sound. 
in the, that there is. And if you turn on an ultrasound probe and you don't have any gel on it or anything, it's just blasting that beam out into the air. So I don't, I don't think that's a proper test. Um, lots of people do it. I've seen lots of sonographers. They turn it on. They don't put anything on. They say, oh, I got dead elements. And they're calling you folks in to come in and look at the probe and see if there's a problem, only to find out, well, there really isn't. But um, uh, I just don't think it's a, a good test. I think it is complicated because of these newer probe technologies and single crystal matrix arrays. They've just got more power. Uh, this image I show you here is a Philips C5-1 air scan. Uh, um, if you look at the... Um, well, I'll show you on the next slide a uh, first call test of uh, this very same probe. You know, it looks like there's some dropout, if you will, but um, as soon as uh, as soon as you put gel on the on this probe, you found out that no, there's nothing wrong with it. The image is just fine. You could put it on a phantom too, for that matter. Um, but I think one of the problems with with today with the certain types of probes that air scan testing really leads you to a misdiagnosis. Because again, even with this, you don't know whether it's a bad cable. Uh, in this case, because it's a single crystal probe, a lot of light, it's a multiplexed probe too, uh, it could be an electronic problem. So if you look at this next slide, and talking about standard uh, probe testing here, um, you know, this one just had some stronger output sections or zones, if you will. Um, I remember this probe personally because it came through our lab, and I mean, we put it on live scan testing, uh, Phantom, found nothing wrong with it. But largely, too, because we could test it, in this case using the first call, uh, we were able to identify, well, there's no dropout, and you, you can see even with this, this uh, shot that, that I put in there, there's no dropout in this probe at all. Uh, the cable was good and so on. So. We, you know, in this case, we saved the customer a lot of money because we were able to show them that your probe's good. Um, it just has a little bit higher output, acoustic output. Um, but I think with with standard probes, and, and of course they are the most numerous out there. Um, again, I think using any of these tools that I mentioned before uh, can really help you identify problems early, and then that's what's going to really cut your cost. Um, one of the things I like to do, and I know it's hard, I know it's very difficult in a hospital environment, uh, but if you, there's a system you can call your gold standard that you can bring your probes to when you want to look at them on a tissue phantom or, or do a little bit of live scanning, that's always good. We try to maintain that in our lab. It's obviously easier for us to do that, but um, you know, sometimes uh, you may have a system that's not, not quite up to snuff. So, uh, always testing the probes that are with that particular system in that particular department uh, may cause you some other other issues. Um, but again, just I think by proper testing uh, of the probe, you can eliminate some things that you don't really need to send out and incur downtime. Some other things in, in general probes. Um, Obviously, a lot of you have seen CW and color noise problems. I would always check the cable. That's going to be 90% plus of your issue is going to be a bad cable when, uh, when those things happen. And these coax, as you can see a picture of what micro coax wires look like, though they're much tinier than that. Um, these things break. They break off the connection to the array. Um, they can short together with other uh, coax, et cetera. But again, Good testing of the probes will, uh, will tell you this and give you an idea where the problem is. Doppler issues, uh, one, just a point I wanted to make. When people talk about dead elements, I've been asked this so many times that, um, you know, it's, it, well, I wish I had that proverbial dime for every time I was asked. But, um, you know, if a, if a probe's got 192 elements and you lose a couple elements on one end or the other, I'd be the first to tell you don't worry about it because it's going to have no clinical effect on the 2D image. Where most dead elements, and, and this is primarily to PZT array technology, <coughs> it's going to occur is in Doppler. And there can be some significant changes 
you can see the two probes, the one on the top and the one on the left, um, uh, are good probes. On the right, uh, some elements were simulated to be dead by taking the wires off. And you can see the differences in the uh, spectral waveforms of the Doppler. Um, the ones on the right, a physician would think there's a problem clinically somewhere. And again, what it's going to do is send the patient to further testing. Even today, I want to tell you that lens technology has even changed. This is, a, again, a Philips C5-1. Um, it's a three-layer lens. It's got a silicone, aluminum, and silicone. Um, again, it, if you change this, if this goes bad, um, and just you try to slap something on it like a standard one layer of silicone, you're changing the whole performance of the probe. So again, even from a testing standpoint, being able to test these things and see that, um, you know, if, let's say you've got a probe back from repair from a company, you want to make sure that you're able to, to test it to make sure that they repaired it right, correct? So again, even lens technology changes. Siemens has one with a layer of gold in between, so that continues to change. 3D, 4D probe testing. Um, most most 3D, 4D probes out there on the market, at least that are using OBGYN, are electromechanical. So we've got a, you know a moving array, we've got an oil bath. Um, uh, again, a lot of things from a testing perspective that most of you I, I hope are doing probably are doing. Uh, you're looking for cuts, leaks, uh, puncture holes, things like that uh, at your PMs and when you're repairing them, you want to catch those. Uh, but some of the things, again, you need a device to, to test these things. That's the range of the sweep. Um, is it, does it come back to center? Um, you know, we get a lot of error codes, um, sensor errors, or it won't, it won't set up, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Again, some of these test devices I showed you can help you identify these problems. Now, there are the new ones out there, the Matrix 3D, 4D Pros, which are electronic 3D, 4Ds. Right now, they're difficult to test, like I said, but um, uh, I'm sure that, that testing is going to be made available uh, in the future. But um, again, they, uh, they're going to have similar problems to a standard probe in many cases. Again, this is one where <clears throat> with, on 3D, 4D with good testing on the right, uh, we had an air bubble. So we can see that. All the sonographer sees and all they're going to tell you is, I got a shadow, I got dropout. <coughs> Excuse me. So you're going to think you've got an array or something like that. We get it in, we find out, oh, no, we just have a bubble. Take the bubble out of the oil bath and the probe is fixed. Um, again, I mentioned you get sensor magnet issues that won't allow the probe to be centered. There's no reference signal. The, the probe doesn't know how far to sweep. Uh, those things are all uh, more on the electronic side. Transesophageal, transesophageal testing um, is always a unique um, issue. Um, again, a lot, of, a lot of the standard composite array PEs out there can be tested uh, with first call and, and other devices uh, as well. But, um, you know, the Philips X72T, these matrix ones, this GE6VT-D, um, can't. Um, the X72T does, is able to be tested by the first call, but, um, you know, it's a very complex pro. I put a little picture up here of the design of the X72T, and, you know, it's got... Um, uh, what's called an ASIC, which is Application Specific Integrated Circuit that is built into the array. And it, again, it, it's a whole different set of problems. Uh, sure, the array can go bad. Typically, they don't. The ASIC can go bad, sure. Uh, but it's embedded in there, uh, literally embedded into each other. So uh, it's a very complex probe, great performance, does a fabulous job. But because it's a TE probe, it's subject to a lot of the other problems with TE probes. And again, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, this is again being able to test an X72T accurately uh, without trying to guess by doing it in a, another manner um, really allows you to identify the problems. One of the things on TEs, which I hope you're doing, 
this was passed by um, uh, IAC and uh, started in December 2015, is after every patient for a lab, echo lab to be certified, they have to do electrical leakage. And um, I just put that up there so that um, you can see that that does need to be done. A lot of labs are doing it, but I still see some that, that aren't. Um, and they, if they, they don't have their certification, uh, or they're going to lose their certification if they don't. So some of the economics of testing. Um, run through this quickly. Uh, we're running late here, but um, I'm just using a Medicare rate of 221. Again, if you wait and you, you're guessing at probes and thinking, oh, okay, I'm going to wait till something's really wrong. Well, you know, if you got a $5,000 exchange or an array replacement on a probe, um, using this calculation, you can see you'd need about 22 and a half, 23 patients that would have to come through the door. And I'm just using Medicare as a reimbursement rate. Um, you'd have to have that done. It'd take about a day and a half if you were doing 15 patients a day just to pay for that repair. Okay. And I'm not including overhead or anything like that as well. So just purely looking at the cost to, uh, of patient throughput to pay for that repair. So again, if you're doing good testing and you're able to look at the probes properly and find out, hey, I got a bad lens, let me send that out. I get that lens fixed for 600 bucks. Again, I'm just throwing a number out there. Now you've got less than three patients. So you can actually get that probe repaired for in a single day's worth of patient and still be generating positive revenue for the hospital. Um, and again, these are things, it's just, you just got to catch them before, before they turn into major problems. So what do these technologies mean? Well, we kind of went through it. early diagnosis, um, try to, try to use some of these new testing, uh, devices. It's my, my humble opinion that you really need to look at doing this, but cleaning and disinfection, the environment of your probes is always important. Um, even storage is, is used. I, we see customers use the wrong probe holder on a machine and they rip the strain release out. And it's only because they're using the wrong probe holder that OEMs designed the system with the proper ones, but they don't want to put them in. So uh, you just need to be aware of these things. And like I said, don't just try to save money, but cut these costs out by catching things early or preventing them. And again, I think you're going to see more electronic problems in the future. Um, lots of multiplexing problems are, are going to continue to get better, worse. Uh, but if we can catch these things early um, and get them solved, it's really going to cut your cost, not just save you money from the previous year's expenditures, but it's going to cut your cost significantly. Uh, and I'm a big fan of, of trying to help you do that. And I think, uh, I think by catching these things and testing, you'll be able to accomplish those things. Because ultimately, as I said at the, at the last bullet point there, we've got to remember that uh, we're dealing with patients' lives and, and they need a good diagnosis. So we've got to make sure that that probe is good because that's where it all starts. And I'd like to thank you very much for your attendance today. And um, we'll end that. Okay, thank you, Bob. We've got uh, just a quick couple of questions. Are these new test devices all available on the market? Yes, they are. Okay, and is an element testing device really necessary? Um, I would say it, it, it all depends on how many probes you have under your jurisdiction. Um, um, it really is what, what are you spending on probes? and then how many you have. Um, the more you have, the more I think you need to look at having a device so that you can test them. Okay, that's great. Um, all right, guys, as we've come to the end of the webinar, um, I'd like to thank Bob for a great webinar, very informative, thank you. And thank you again to today's sponsors, uh, Conquest Imaging. Um, I'd like to remind the attendees that you are able to win an Amazon gift card just for completing the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. You must complete the survey to obtain your certificate of attendance. If you don't see the survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. 
For more information about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website, webinarwednesday.live. Thanks once again, Bob, and everybody have a great day and see you next time. Thank you.